Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Glad to see some new faces here this morning. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. I uh, just have one announcement uh, this morning, and I uh, just wanted to fill you in on uh, our successful first time blood drive yesterday. Uh, we had a total of 21 uh, people come to give, uh, but only 16 were actually able or qualified to give for a various number of reasons. So those 16 units of blood saved 48 lives. And they kept saying that over and over, you saved 48 lives. So great job, uh, Plateau. Great job, Wesley, in coordinating it all. Uh, we plan to do it again, um, but we'll talk about the frequency. Maybe we'll go to spring and fall, or maybe we'll just do it once a year, but I think uh, because it was successful, we need to continue to do it um, and, and make a difference. Are there any other announcements? Yes, Audrey. I just wanted to say a little something about our food, mobile food pantry. Um, that seems to be really going well, and I really do appreciate um, all of the contributions that people are making. Uh, we will make our next delivery not next week, but the week after. And if you have, if you want to donate something for that specific one, right now it's looking like we could use peanut butter and jelly. Um, so those are things that we include every time. So um, if you have something specific you want to get, you might pitch in on that. But thank you so much for the contributions. Uh, we have, I think, lots of um, good food to send out to the families that we deliver to. Thank you, Audrey. Any other? Yes. I got a message from Sue Smith. She said to tell everybody in the church she's waiting for visitors. Bring them on, she says. <laughs> <laughs> she looked great. She uh, was really into the conversations and made our hearts all feel good. Yeah, she is now able to receive visitors inside, not through a window. So, um, I things. Where is she now? I forgot where um, she is. Abernathy, okay. Laurel. Yeah. You have to make an appointment to go. Uh, I don't know if you heard that. You need to make an appointment to go. And it was Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays the last time I talked there for appointments. <laughs> Any other announcements? Yes, Sheila. This was my fault that Rhonda didn't put the flowers in the uh, bulletin because I put it on the door too late. But they're a member of uh, Mama and Daddy and David and Sharon. And I think everybody knows. That's my mother and father and our Thank you, Sheila. Flowers today are in memory of Sheila's family. Well, let's begin with God's Word. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with a lyre, with a lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Amen. And now if you would please open your bulletin and join together in our call to worship. <laughs> Rise and greet this morning. Arise, meet the risen Christ, who encourages our faltering steps, who wrinkles us with compassion, 
Rise now and sing your praise. Amen. Let us pray. God on high, give us hearts full of gratitude. We have so much to celebrate, and we ask that you would fill our souls with a pure desire to worship you. The gift you have given us in the right raising of your Son from the dead is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. We want our worship to reflect the elation that we all feel. Thank you for being present with us here this morning. Guide us as we worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd all please rise now for our first hymn.
From them she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we customarily do each Sunday morning, we take the time to share together as a body of Christ our joys and our concerns. So if you have a joy or concern, uh, please share it as the Spirit leads. Yes, Steve. Um, my mother's 93 today, and her brother, which is my uncle, will be 101 Friday. Wow. wow. That's good. <laughs> And they're both in good shape. Yes. Praise God. <clears throat> we need to remember <clears throat> Bill Levin as he's supposedly going to begin treatments or getting the issues satisfied this week and so forth. Both Carolyn and Jan, yes. <clears throat> Any other joys and concerns? Uh, yes, Louisa. As my youngest sister, she flew out this morning to go to Maryland. Uh, you heard me last Sunday ask for prayer requests for her mother-in-law, Pat Greer. Things didn't go well this week and they've called the family, the Holy Park family together. And she's still, still conscious, but she's been a very sick lady. <coughs> What was her name again? Pat Patricia Pat. Greer. Pat. She's in Maryland. She's at one of the best hospitals, but they're sending her back to the house today with around the clock nurses for her. To, that was her choosing um, to rest until it's her time. Simply put, they found uh, a lesion in her esophagus this week, and this, uh, there was no doctor in, uh, in that area that would say. I'm going to do the surgery. The doctors just said that there'd be no way they would mm -hmm. attempt the surgery. So it's just a matter of time. It's so. a praise for Pat. Precious lady, she has eight children. And uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a big family. Big family. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Any other joys or concerns? Yes, Barbara. Uh, and uh, my heart, which is uh, and I'm healed right now. She's in hospital and they're not sick. Redner Learheart. Edna. Edna, yes. I think it's just a praise to be here in church this morning. Amen. Amen. Good to see all these beautiful faces. <laughs> Double amen. But there are no more joys or concerns left, pray. Almighty, gracious, and loving God, we thank you for each day that you give us, each day that you bless us with, and we're so grateful, Lord, uh, for this day, this beautiful day that you blessed us with, for all the folks that have come and gathered here at Plateau United Methodist Church to worship you. Lord, we've just taken some time to share names of people that are in need of your help, your healing touch, the Lord. We ask that you uh, intercede in their lives and touch them, uh, let them know of your presence. Lord, for those that are uh, grieving a loss, let them know that you are also with them in this time of need, this time of grieving that loss of either a family member or a treasured friend. Lord, for those that are struggling with addictions and bondage to <coughs> other things, Lord, we ask that you break those chains, allow them to be free to live the life that you created them to live. 
Lord, we pray as always to keep us all safe, keep us all healthy, keep us all strong, uh, that we might find new and different and better ways to give you all praise, glory, and honor. And as we close this time of prayer, we close it with the words that Jesus left us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite our children to come forward for our children's message. Take 
vacations for what reason? To escape the normal, don't we? And don't you come back refreshed? Sometimes parents come back and say, oh, that was such a good feeling, but it was tiring, right? <laughs> that would be, we experience a lot of those. You're providing a place where God can speak to you without competing with the electronic gadgets and just simply looking up into the stars many times and saying, oh, thank you, Jesus. Listening to your parents to rest, you'll find a look, a book to read, or maybe that puzzle to organize, and mom finds you suddenly asleep. Da -da, da -da, da -da, right? But refreshing your body and mind is so relaxed. It's like God saying, come with me and get some rest. Remember, God created the day and the night for the earth to rest in the darkness. So it's really important to take the time to rest because God did. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, your presence is felt in this holy place. We thank you for all the words and the music and the prayers that are lifted to you today. We thank you for these precious children. Guide all of us as children in your way, O oh Lord. And we thank you. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at, your, look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in, they, in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the saints must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. invite themselves in and blend in with all the others until the host may or may not approach them and question them as to why and who they are and what they're doing there. Well, our scripture this morning speaks of the art of party crashing. This time, however, the party crasher is actually Jesus. The interesting thing is that it wasn't a party until Jesus actually showed up. Because before he got there, things were kind of gloomy. They didn't look real good. Jesus wasn't exactly an uninvited guest in the story, but he certainly was unexpected. And after his crucifixion, his disciples were trying to sort out in their minds the meaning of all the reports that they started to hear about the appearances of the risen Christ. It was a time where it was very, very confusing to all of them. And they questioned it. Was it a hoax? Perhaps it was some type of ghost? But all that aside, it's important for us to see that it First, it was very, very difficult for the early believers and followers of Christ to actually believe that he had, in fact, resurrected from the dead. But then suddenly it happened. The disciples were gathered there together in one place, and 
all of a sudden the crucified Christ presented himself and stood among them. They were all startled. They were all frightened like we would probably be ourselves. Then Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you question? What's going on in your hearts? See my hands. See my feet. That it is in fact I myself. Well, the response of the disciples could be a total sermon in itself, so we won't go there today. But Luke tells us that they disbelieved for joy. It was so simply wonderful to be true. He was alive and he was with them right there in their presence. He'd been raised from the dead. Talk about bringing life to a party. No wonder they had difficulty believing. Unfortunately, there are some folks today that still have a problem with believing that. Many desperately want to believe, but something just kind of holds them back. See my hands. See my feet. I met Ray Ray in prison about 30 years ago. He was 19 years old and was in for attempting to murder his father. Ray Ray grew up in a large family and he seemed to always end up as the recipient of his father's anger and his father's rage. The constant belittling, and many times the physical beating that he took, took its toll on him. And then one day he tried to kill his father, but fortunately he failed. But as a result, he ended up in prison, which turned out to be probably the best thing that could have ever happened to him. Because it was there that he heard the message of Jesus. And through Cairo's prison ministry, he learned that Jesus was the sole embodiment of God's love and forgiveness. That he came to die for us on the cross and to take away all of our sins and to give us a brand new life. Well, since that time, almost 30 years ago, Ray Ray has been released. I actually got to meet him when I was working at my in-law's pizza place. He walked in one day. He looked at me and he said, Kairos? And I said, yeah, it's me, Ray Ray. He'd gotten married. He'd started a small towing business. And I found out recently that he had returned to Puerto Rico, went to seminary and got a degree. And now he's back in that Waterbury, Connecticut area leading a small pastoring a small Spanish-speaking church very close to that prison where he was incarcerated. And he told me, he said, all I wanted to do is to help other wounded people make good decisions. The resurrected Christ that showed the disciples his scars and he was going to send them, because he was going to send them out to do the work that the Father had sent him to do to save wounded people like you and I. And they couldn't save wounded people like you and I unless they could see and touch Jesus' wounds. Only then could they proclaim the confidence or with confidence the limitless love of God. I think many people desperately want to believe, but something just holds them back. Maybe if they could see those scars, it would make a difference. Why? 
I'm not sure, but let me try to offer a couple of reasons. For one thing, some people have difficulty believing that God really cares about hurting people that much. That He would give His life for them. A real life Savior with scars in His hands and feet and side. I think some of us tend to be more comfortable with an impersonal type God. Now don't get me wrong. I'm talking about a God who has done all the things that Scripture tells us that He's done, but not really someone we want to get real close to. We want to keep our distance. We need that kind of space. The idea of God with nail prints in His hands and feet inside because of His great love for us is an idea we're really not quite ready to believe in yet. How outrageous are some of the claims we read in the Gospel? Well, simply stated, the God of all creation sent His Son Jesus to come down to earth and suffer and die and to say to us that no one, no one on this earth is beyond God's love and God's concern. No one. In trying to deal with the meaning of the cross on which Christ died, the early church came to understand that those nail prints in his hands and feet and side should have been ours. But God so loved the world that He sent His own Son to bear that burden brought about the inequities of us all. Can you deal with that? Can you believe that God really cares about you that much? Jesus' courage was rooted in His love for all of humanity. He knew we could never possibly be good enough by our own efforts to stand in the presence of a holy God. So He covered our sins with His holy blood and made His perfect, or made us perfect in God's sight. He paid for our sins to set us free from the power of death. I'm sure many of you have all seen stories where someone is really down on their luck. They have a huge bill that they have to pay and they don't have the money to pay it. But then, mysteriously, all of a sudden, someone enters into their path and pays the bill and doesn't want anything in return. And then when the recipient tries to go back and pay that amount of generosity, they're told, no worries, consider it paid. What beautiful words. Consider it paid. And those are the words that Christ speaks to each one of us. Our sins, our debts, our failures. Consider it paid. The empty grave, the empty cross, the wounds in Jesus' hands and feet and side, they're all physical reminders of God's ultimate announcement to humanity. Consider it paid. That's how much God loves us. And yes, it's hard to believe that God loves us that much. But those scars are a reminder. Secondly, and unfortunately, there are some who simply have difficulty believing that life goes beyond the tomb. I know it's hard for some of us to fathom that a Christian would have a difficult time believing that. Yet such a conviction is at the heart of our faith if we truly are Christians. It's very difficult for most of us to face the thought of dying. It's normal for us to think that that's the end of it all. 
But those of us with faith have the assurance that when this life ends here on earth, a brand new one begins for all eternity. I think I can understand that sentiment. None of us wants to die, but that's life. We're all going to die at some point in time. But praise God, that's not our final destiny. We were created for life, not for death. God didn't bring us into being for this world only. Christ showed us that death is no longer our enemy. Death has been conquered. Because Christ lives, we too shall live. Amen? Amen. And all the non-believing world can do with death is just fear it, ridicule it, deny it, or avoid talking about it altogether. But not those that have seen the scars of the risen Savior. Because they know that He is alive because He lives. So shall we live. So there are many people who resist believing the good news that Christ is alive. Some just can't believe God really loves us that much. Others just can't believe that life really goes on beyond the grave. But even more significantly, they don't want to deal with the implications of those two truths. So what does it mean if this life really is just a prelude to everlasting life? And what difference would it make in your life to see the hands and the feet and the side of the risen Christ? Would it cause you to be a whole lot more serious about your walk with Jesus? Would it have some effect on the goals that you've set for your life? After all, if life is indeed eternal, some of our goals are going to seem kind of short-sighted and self-serving, aren't they? What goals do you have in your life? What objectives do you have? What are the things that you want to accomplish before your life comes to an end here on earth? Is it a bigger house? Nicer car? Home at the beach? Home in the mountains? A trip to the Holy Land to enrich or to enhance your spiritual journey. I recently saw a short video. It was about a young man who was very bright. And he was working in an office with, with another gentleman and they both worked for a very mean-spirited boss. And this bright young man came up with a great idea, a transforming type idea. And he was telling his co-worker, I'm not going to bring this idea into the boss and see what he thinks. And the other uh, co-worker said, don't waste your time. You know like, how he is. He's just going to ignore it. But the, the bright young man said, I know, but I really feel convicted about this idea. I think it can really, really make a difference. So we went in to see the boss. The boss didn't even look up when he walked in. In fact, he worked there for three or four years. The boss didn't even know his name. And the bright young man said, excuse me, sir, I'd like to show you an idea that I've been working on. And the boss looked up and said, you want to give me the project that I asked you to complete? And the bright young man said, no, no, I've come up with this brand new idea that I think is going to be revolutionary. He said, that's not what I asked you for. I asked you to do the project I gave you. Now get back out to your desk, finish it, and I want it in my office by the end of the day. Well, obviously, the young man was 
dejected. And he walked out of the office and went back to his work area and was sharing with his co-worker. And the co-worker said, yeah, see, I told you that would happen. And on his workstation wall was a piece of paper that had some numbers on it. It said 25 slash 76 equals 33 percent. And as I was watching, I said, I wonder what those numbers mean. But then he explained it. He said, I'm 25 years old and I just recently read that the average typical lifespan of a person is 76 years. So if I divide my age by the total average lifespan, I come up with 33%. I've spent 33% of my life already. And that means I've only got 67% of my life left to spend. And I don't think I want to do it working in this situation. I want to make a difference in this world. I started thinking about that because I, I never really thought about death that much. Yeah, I know that a point in time is going to come when God's ready. But I'm ready when God's ready. But those numbers started to sink in. I said, hmm, I'm 69 years old. If, in fact, the average age is 76, that means I've lived 91% of my life. 91% of my life. I've only got 9% left. Maybe if I make it to 76, or maybe God will bless me and I live to... 90. I know I certainly am not going to live to the age of that lady that lives in Charlotte that just passed away that was 116 years old. No way I'm going to make it that far. But don't ever question God. But I started thinking, what am I going to do with that remaining 9%? How am I going to make a difference? How are you going to make a difference with the percentage that you've got left to live? Former disgraced presidential advisor and prison fellowship founder Chuck Colson tells of visiting one of his mentors. His name was Ken Wesner. And he did that a few days before Wesner actually passed away. So Wesner was a very successful businessman. He was the CEO of Service Master Corporation. Maybe some of you have seen their trucks driving around. They're a huge company. Well, after his retirement, Wesner dedicated his time and energy to a variety of different ministries. And now he was dying of kidney cancer. But he wasn't scared. Or he wasn't self-pitying or sad. He had this peace. And he had this joy that comforted all those that were around him. A few days later, Wesner called his close friend, Ken Hansen, who also was dying. And Wesner's wife tells about the conversation the two men had, about the joy of meeting Jesus about having brand new bodies without any pain, without any sickness or weakness. And because of their faith in the promises of God and the sacrifice of Jesus, both men faced their suffering and death with joy and confidence. Yeah, Jesus had crashed the disciples' pity party. They'd seen the hands and the feet of the risen Christ and they knew that there is more to life than death. And those who live their lives in the light of eternity never, ever run out of a purpose for life. See my hands, see my feet, said Christ to those disciples. God really does love you that much. 
Life really goes on beyond the tomb, beyond the grave. So my question to all of you this morning is, how are you going to live the remainder of your life beginning today in response to those two great truths that we talked about Jesus? Let's pray. Most gracious and loving God, all we can do is say thank you. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for what he did for each and every one of us. The gift that just goes on and on and on given. Lord, we, we pray that as a church family gathered here this morning that you give us the strength and the courage to evaluate where we stand in life and take a look at our goals, our objectives. What do we really want to accomplish and how much of that are we going to try to accomplish for you versus accomplishing for ourselves? Help us, Lord, we pray. Give us wisdom and discernment. Give us joy and peace that you're always present. For we pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <coughs> Please rise for our closing hymn.
Many of you know Superman, right? And Superman in real life was Clark Kent. And whenever he needed to become Superman, he hopped into a telephone booth and changed out of his business suit into his Superman outfit. Because in his business suit, he couldn't stop steaming locomotives or leap tall buildings with a single button. He had to have the identity of that Superman suit. And like Superman, we all have the identity of Christ. And with that identity, we can do mighty things. So as you leave this morning, go hop into your phone booth, if you can find one. <laughs> Change into your Jesus outfit and go do mighty things. Go now blessed in his presence and his love and his forgiveness and his mercy. Have a great week. Stay healthy. Stay strong. We'll see you again next week. God bless you all. Have a great day.